Major support for Out to Lunch is provided by the law firm of Jones Walker, established in 1937 with over 375 attorneys in offices throughout the U.S., providing a comprehensive range of services to a local, national, and international client base. JonesWalker.com. And by Shorten Associates, legal recruiters in Louisiana and Texas. And by Wyndham Garden Lafayette. From Cafe Vermilionville in Lafayette, we're out to lunch with creative business consultant Aileen Bennett. It's business, Acadiana style. Hi, I'm Aileen Bennett. Welcome to Out to Lunch. The difference between men and women is a subject that's been examined for per- since perhaps the beginning of time. Whether you believe the conversation starts with Adam and Eve or a couple of organisms crawling out of the primordial soup, commentary about what sets genders apart is the province of everyone, from archaeologists to comedians. You'd be forgiven for wondering what we can contribute to this conversation on a radio show and podcast about Acadiana business. Well, here goes. I'm going to start with Emily Deegan. Emily is the owner and CEO of a company called St. Hugh. St. Hugh makes clothes for women, women who are involved in an activity that, for the most part, is the province of men, hunting. Emily discovered that when she was a young girl who liked to go hunting with her dad that there were no hunting clothes that fit her properly and the ones that did fit didn't look good. St Hugh solves that problem by making outdoor apparel specifically designed for women. St Hugh designs look good and they take into account the different demands of a woman's bodies out there in the marsh or wood. Emily, welcome to Out to Lunch. Thank you for having me. Ross Fontenot started out his business in 2011 by dressing men. Ross and his business partner, John Peterson, opened a fashion-forward menswear store in Lafayette called Gentry. John left Gentry to start up the soft drink company Swamp Pop. Ross stayed at Gentry, expanding the store and its market to include women's fashion. Ross, welcome to Out to Lunch. Thanks, Ali. Emily, clearly there's nothing men can do that women can't. But there are some things that men do in our society that women, by and large, don't. For example, play football and hunt. There may be all kinds of sexist and cultural reasons that American women don't do these things, but purely in a business sense, you could make clothes for women who play football, but there would be a pretty small market. So if you're part of the hunting fund, how do you target women hunters? How many of them are there and how do you find them? That's a great question. So before we got started, we did a lot of market research to do exactly that, to quantify the market for these types of products that I knew that I needed and personally knew that other women hunters needed. So what we did was we took data from the Department of Wildlife and Fisheries and applied that to Census Bureau data to identify basically how big the market is in the southeast. So we took the number of hunting licenses issued, which were split by gender, to see the number of women hunters in southeastern states, and then also added in... um, Another market which we kind of termed like hunting sympathizers, so maybe women that don't necessarily get out there and hunt themselves, but like to go with their husbands, significant others, or otherwise are excited about the sport. I think I love the term hunting sympathizer. (laughs) Yeah, it sounds a little clinical, but you know, it works for our purposes. But they still needed the warm clothes that fit them rather than wearing the things that were made for men. Right, exactly. So we looked at the number of hunting licenses issued um, by state and applied that to the average family size by state to try to come up with the number of women that, you know, had a brother or a close cousin that, you know, could be interested in our products. And we quantified that market at 3.2 million potential customers. So this all sounds very logical. It yes. wasn't just that I really want to do this. I'm going to say I'm feeling a little less than for not having done nearly <laughs> these many analytics for my business. So I'm going to start out there. Well, I'm a CPA by background, so I think that we comes guessed. a little bit easier to me than... But was it also I really want to do this? Oh, absolutely. I mean, that was the whole impetus for it. So... Um, Like you mentioned, I grew up duck hunting with my dad in southeastern Louisiana and constantly struggled to find clothes that fit right or felt good, much less looked good. So it had been an idea that had been in the back of my mind for a long time. Um, I started my career in Chicago working for an accounting firm, but couldn't kick this idea of this dream that I'd always wanted to pursue, this business venture, um, and ultimately I, I just took the plunge and did it. So... Absolutely. It was definitely kind of a combination of head and heart for me. So let's ask Ross about his research. (laughs) Ross, there's no doubt that over the past decade, Acadiana has been changing. Nonetheless, I would think that the metrosexual hipster guy who's prepared to spend hundreds of dollars on a designer plaid shirt, a beanie and beard balm is still a rarity around here. 
In a big city, there are multiple places where men shop for fashion-forward clothes. Besides giving men a wide range of choices, that kind of repeated exposure to fashion also acts as an education. Here in Acadiana, you're one of the few games in town. With men being less exposed to fashion, it's easier for them to play safe and dress conservatively. How do you get over that? How do you sell Acadiana men on Manhattan fashion? Um, well, um, I think we came, we opened around the time that social media was really starting to blossom. So I think for the same reason that it was, uh, it was accessible to like some of these brands, maybe slightly more designer, slightly um, uh, less accessible, were actually accessible um, to view, I guess, a little so bit. So people were seeing them and, all the time. Right, and, and so um, still not a lot, but um, like we, we're still very uh, kind of a new concept in the area, but uh, but people are catching on to uh, to certain brands a little bit easier, or to the idea. A lot of people will still come into the store and say, "Oh well, uh, oh I've seen this online," you know. And so th that was a big help. So you sell a lifestyle as well as clothes. You sell other things. For those who yes. haven't been to your store in downtown Lafayette, tell me what it's like to walk in the store. Um, so uh, what? You know, it's hard. I, for me, I I guess I, you know, I've become so accustomed to it. But um, well, You're greeted by the most adorable dog in the world right. to start. Yes, exactly. Yeah, my black lab, Remy, is a sweetheart. And as long as you like dogs, um, I think, you know, that will, um, that will definitely uh, be really charming for you. But other than that, I think, you know, we keep, um, there's no fluorescent lighting and the, it's all, um, you know, incandescent bulbs and uh, so low lighting and which... Um, it's and chill and well designed. Right. It's a comfortable it space to be yeah, in. Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah. Emily, your company is called St. Hugh. Why? So St. Hubert was actually the patron saint of hunting. Um, he was the first advocate for humane hunting and came up with a number of principles um, for hunters to, to really abide by. And when you by. came up so, with that name, were you like, yes, this is the name? Yeah, so no, actually I think naming it was maybe the hardest thing that I did because I came up with so many bad names that, you know, at a certain point you just, you kind of have like paralysis and you're like, I can't think of any more names and everything sounds terrible. Rush your naughty. I, yeah, yeah. I mean, I almost like... To this day, I mean, I think we even just discussed the fact that I happened to, for some reason, use um, a French word that I thought would localize. Yeah, because your your story, you pronounce it gentry, um, but it's spelled gentry. Yeah, right, right, right. Uh, but meanwhile, like most people, don't you know they butcher it past um, even its English pronunciation of the English word. So I don't know, but so I have to like, do I maybe even slightly do I regret it? No, but. There's like, you know, there's always the moments where people just like don't know how to say it and then they ask, you know, and you get enough of those in a day and then yeah. you start like, doubting yourself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A lot but, of people ask St. U and I'm like, no, H U G H, St. U. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So exactly. I just, I That's, find myself spelling it just right, from the get go now. Right, right, right. So, Emily, there's 3.2 million hunting sympathizers <laughs> out there. Where do you find them? How do you tell them, hey, I've got this and you need it? Yeah, so we kind of have a twofold approach. We sell online on our website. It's St. Hugh, H U G H dot C O. Um, so we sell there and we market digitally on Instagram, Facebook, et cetera. Very targeted ads. Very targeted ads, yes. There's a lot of SEO and complicated analytics in the background that go into finding the right market um, to serve our ads to. But then we also do a traveling series of pop up shops. Um, so we did that more kind of in the first year or so when we first got started to really get our name out there, get our product in front of people because if there's one thing that I think that I underestimated a little bit when I first got started was that people, particularly for new brands, they want to see and feel and touch products and try them on, which is why I think there's always going to be a huge market for brick and, brick and mortar retail. Do you refer to it as hunting apparel or outdoor apparel? What do you call yeah. it? So I guess the vision I see for the company is to be more of an outdoor apparel line, so a bit more inclusive than just hunting, but our first line definitely was made with female hunters in mind, so I say fashion for it, outdoor apparel. And when you design with female hunters in mind, mm -hmm. tell me what that actually means. What's different making the female... Yep. 
So although I didn't have a lot of design experience when I started St. Hugh, I knew as a consumer what I wanted in an end product. So I wanted something with kind of slim fitting sleeves, with um, lines that were more functional for female use. And what I mean by that is all of our products actually come in both right and left handed styles. So our zippers are angled such that you have more space for whichever shoulder you shoot on. And we also, um, we pad the shoulder, we pad our products with, in the shoulder area with what's called 3D spacer fabric, which is highly compressive and protects women's collarbones, which tend to protrude more than men's so that we don't bruise when we shoot. And that's something that a lot of, um, a lot of our customers have liked a lot. We also made very deep pockets with kind of slim openings and um, lined everything with a mid-weight Polar Tech fleece. Um, can I ask a question? Absolutely. I mean, you're not, yeah, you're, um, so she's wearing, a, I'm assuming this is one of your vests. Yes. How did you, where did you find this fabric? Because it's like a camo, right, but yeah. it's like a, this interesting <laughs> Thank cross. Thank you. Yeah. So I actually, I designed the print myself. It's in a herringbone style. Yeah. So what I did was I took thousands of photos of the marsh grass where I hunt over the course of a season and time lapsed them so I could see how the colors changed. And then I kind of drew and layered and made this own print with a custom color palette. I chose a herringbone style because I like the way the up and down of the print kind of mirrored the blades of the marsh grass and I wanted to create something that was fashion forward enough to wear as streetwear but also would be functional in the field. Yeah. I love it. I mean, like Thank the you. color, like that's and the even stories you have you about your brand. I know, Ross. A lot of your brands are sold by stories. Yeah. It's the the history of who makes it and where they make it. And that's exactly it. Yeah, I think like um, I think it's important. I think for any brand in general to have like you know any sort of history like that kind of story that like I love telling that as a as a wholesaler of, of clothing. I love you know mentioning that kind of story and then just that that this pattern was created, you know, this fabric was created by by the owner. You know, like, people people love that, including myself. People love myself, that personal you know, touch. And, yeah. So you started at a menswear store, and then you decided to open to women's clothing. What made that decision happen? Um, well, to be completely honest, it was that um, in what we were doing was a little bit of a struggle um, to do just men's apparel in, in, a, in our market of uh, Lafayette. And we, uh, you know, so I, I knew that it would be at least doubling my my sales just based on the amount that women. And I'm sure women, women and, came in a lot and said, "You should sell clothes for yeah, me." Yeah, that had been happening for years. Um, as long as we were open as a men's store as well, I just didn't know how to do it. Um, and exact because I, <clears throat> I barely had enough experience in men's apparel, much less um, women. So. Uh, bringing in a friend who had a lot of experience helped me uh, begin to do buying, and actually, she was handling all of that, and she's done a great job with it. So, so Emily, I'm going to ask you the same. You know what questions come in? Are you then going to do menswear in hunting? You know, my goal when I first started was to give to, was to fill a gap in the market, and men are not currently underserved <laughs> in the hunting apparel market. Whereas women are underserved in a variety of other outdoor activities, like hiking, for example. I, that's kind of where I see us perhaps growing next. You're listening to Out to Lunch. I'm Aileen Bennett. I'm talking with Ross Fontenot from Gentry and Emily Deegan from St. Hugh. Emily and Ross, this is the part of the show that we call your brother-in-law. You're in a car at a red light when your phone rings. It's your brother-in-law. Usually, he only calls to invite you to come along when he's a guest DJ at Scandals, but this time it's different. This time he has a business proposition. Emily, your brother-in-law has an idea for expanding your product line beyond just clothes for women who like to hunt. He's got a couple of ideas for other products, like for example a designer ammo can. It's an ammo can that can be used for ammo when you're hunting, or you clip on a shoulder strap and it's a fashion statement pocketbook. What do you tell your brother-in-law? Does an ammo can pocketbook open the door to a whole new line of hunter-style women's fashion? It could, but that's not really a product that needs to be gender specific. That's such a sweet way to say that. <laughs> so I'm not sure it's something that I would necessarily invest in, in developing, but I mean, there's, there's absolutely a market for that, for having a customizable ammo can that... It's just know, not what your target market has, have been asking for. Right, exactly. Ross, your brother-in-law has an idea how to find new customers for your store. Gentry Singles Night. 
is basically brick and mortar Tinder. With their drinks and clothes discount, you offer 10% off anything in the store to anyone who's single. You have some wine, beer and good music. Your brother-in-law will even DJ for a special rate. He says if you do a gentrist single night regularly once a month, you'll attract men and women equally. And it's the kind of social, casual experience that the kids today are into. What do you think? Does your brother-in-law have a halfway decent marketing idea here? Um, yeah, I would say yes, a half decent. Um, I mean, I someone has actually approached me about a similar concept before and um, only it was a woman who owned a gelato shop and not my brother-in-law and um, and I um, I like the idea but I um, in a way uh, but I I don't want to I guess I wouldn't really want to turn into a um, speed dating like that um, I don't know I like the idea of gatherings but not calling them like singles nights um i think that is just not really like my style um so yeah, how do you a... decide what's going to happen next because you have to buy things a season ahead yeah. how do you know what we want to wear in a few months time that's a good question um so the um i go to uh, trade shows in new york which uh for one just being in new york is almost like you can agree to this having lived in Chicago like I mean so there's a few I feel like you know as contemporary as I as I like to claim my style and the store style is I think there's also always um, you know trends and fads that you have to kind of buy far and um, and just being in the larger like larger cities kind of is a is a really good concept of what will be in South Louisiana um, you know, it, that that gap um, is closing a little bit more with social media, I feel like, but... Um, but, but the fact I that they like, can see it online, but, but go and but, try it on in right. your store. And also, trade, the, you know, the trade shows, the brands kind of give me a good idea, especially seeing them all in one place. You get an idea of what at least will be trending in, you know, um, 10 months. And uh, so, yeah... We, uh, Emily, how, how important are trends in what you do? Because you're designing for hunting, but do people want to buy new hunting gear for a new hunting season? No, um, not necessarily. So I guess one of my goals in starting this company was giving female hunters uh, a garment that they could wear not only when they're hunting, but get more use out of to wear as streetwear as well. So it's something that I see being a lasting piece for most people. So we tend to focus on more classic cuts and classic styles rather than chasing the latest trend so that people can, you know, really have their garments for a long time. And do you have plans for brick and mortar or are you staying online? Um, so that's a good question. I would like to get more into brick and mortar because I do feel like I underestimated how important that is to people um, when I first got started, but I don't have any plans to open a store of my own. Do you wholesale at all by any chance? I don't right now. I think there's a business deal about <laughs> yeah. to be done yeah. here. Um, well. And that's something you would consider carrying. Is it because it's it's kind of cool as well as practical? Yes, exactly. And it's well, and it speaks to the the lo to South Louisiana. I feel like as well. You know, I mean, like with the amount of hunters, I there's a I want to sell it for the same reason that you that you make it and sell it. And I I guess um, you know I like I said I went hunting this morning. I think it it kind of fits a you know into our lifestyle that here uh, you know enough that um and what's interesting too i think is that there are like a lot of store you know i could see there's a lot of stores that we might get compared to wouldn't carry something like that that are like a little bit more um you know i say it um i mean um maybe more trendy or just like but we we like i like a high quality product and um and something that i that has a story you know, that emily is your market geographical like we think because because we live here in south louisiana that the hunting is based here but how how big is your market is it south louisiana or is it the whole of the states so south louisiana and southeastern united states are definitely my focus right now but um i actually i traveled to reno nevada for a trade show about a year and a half ago and was really 
it was really eye-opening for me because a lot of women in California really liked, I, I obviously I designed my products with Southeastern Louisiana in mind, but a lot of women in California really liked the palette and female hunters there were like, oh, this is great where we live. They were like, this is great for South African hunting. It just kind of opened my eyes to how much more, how much bigger the market could be. But, um, you know, I'm obviously based out of southeastern Louisiana, so this is my focus right now. But uh, more long term, I do see it being something that could have a larger footprint. So international eventually? Hopefully. That, I mean, that would be awesome. Ross, <laughs> kind of the same question to you. Do you plan to open other stores? And eventually they're going to be a whole chain of gentries across the south. I would love that. Um, well, first of all, I need to go in the direction of online, and hopefully I'll have that going within the next few weeks. Are you going um, with the Instagram buy it from this picture model? Yes, I will have I will have that availability, so uh, that option. And uh, yeah, I'm excited because I, from what I understand, a lot of people use that. You know, I mean, like uh, people love the concept of just being able to see things and then just... just Emily, I'm guessing social media has helped grow your business. What, what do you use? What works for you? So Instagram has probably been um, the platform that has worked best for us. Um, just the use of hashtags has helped us really plug into communities of other female hunters that are looking for products like these. And I think that um, that hashtag utility really provides. So ha value. what hashtags do you use on a regular basis and how did you find those hashtags? Yeah, so the ones that are kind of our trademark, so our, our sort of logo, it says St. Hugh. It has an arrow beneath it and it says women who hunt, women who seek. And so I use those two hashtags a lot, but then kind of Beneath the post, I'll also do hashtag female hunter, hashtag girls hunt too, and a number of other hashtags that I've just found um, a, lot of, a lot of other female hunters use in their own posts. Because it's like you have to work out what they're already using and join right. in, rather than so many stores try to create their own hashtag and think people will find it. But you have to work out what's already going on, the people that will buy your clothes and use what they're already using. Exactly. You have to meet customers where they are. Ross, have you found that on social media that you have to like learn the market first and fit in before you can stand out? Certainly. Um, yeah, um, I'm trying to think how exactly we've done that. I mean, I know um, as far as social media, I think I'm still trying to figure out the algorithms of Instagram, say, I think, um, but um, I think a lot of people will find us through just doing these broad tags like sale and have you um, ever done a study like do you, know, you get more likes on a post if Reme the dog is in it than if it's just an so outfit of the day weirdly and this is not great for my ego but um pictures i think i have a lot of followers who either know me or know who i am and um <laughs> it's so strange and i don't i don't love being in the instagram uh but i a lot of the time uh, me or other employees or, or maybe a few friends are the ones who uh, end up modeling clothes and while I'm like not nearly a great model um, I end up doing it and those photos tend to get the most likes <laughs> I, and, I, and I like and so I it's like we we just keep doing it for that reason because like I know that it's good for the, the account so I found the exact same thing <laughs> Photo, photos of either myself or my dog, you know, we we tend to get the most likes, and it's you know it's a little bit odd, but I'm gonna do, do whatever know, works. So actually, one of the most just on the subject um, for, I and mean, I think it's just the ridiculous part of social media is the fact that it was a um, uh, April Fool's Day, and I posted a picture of a hamburger and said that we were gonna start selling hamburgers in the store. That got more likes than anything else had yet that year and then also people begin to like come in and ask me I guess just because it it got a lot of traction people were asking and and also telling other people that we were going to start selling burgers. did you consider at any point becoming and, a burger store um, I I want to I know even less about food than I knew about clothing when I started selling it but um, I guess I'll never. Is say it a never. case of listening to the people and going? Actually, we well, sell burgers and clothes. I will say clothes. this: I think whether you, people that asked about it seriously, I would just say like, well, I, I don't think. Um, can you imagine like the like, the kitchen smell like involved with like in all the clothes? I'm like, how exactly would I do that? I mean, that's. 
I think people business. like to know that you're both real, and I think that's why you get. They like to know Emily that you actually hunt. Right. And do you still have time to do that with running a fashion empire? I do. Yeah. I mean, it's a little ironic because I find that you know most of the time that hunting season tends to coincide with my busiest season from a St. Hugh perspective, so I don't get to hunt quite as much as I used to, but I do still, I mean, I, I love it, and I do get out there whenever I can. And you test new kind of clothes. You go, I'm testing this to see what it's like. Yeah, I do. I do, actually. That's cool. There's no doubt that what we wear is a reflection of who we are. No matter how open-minded, accepting and tolerant we are, we still make judgments about other people and ourselves based on clothes. So seeing that no matter what we choose to wear, we're going to project something, we might as well make an effort to be ourselves. Whether it's at work or out in the marsh, it's nice to have that choice. Emily, we might live in a society where most women don't naturally think about going hunting, but it's nice to have that choice. Ross, we may live in a part of the world where it's not too easy to look fashionable, but it's nice to have that choice choice. Emily and Ross, thank you both for giving us choices and thank you both for taking the time to join me today on Out to Lunch. Thank you. Thank you. My guests on Out to Lunch today have been Emily Deegan, owner and CEO of St. Hugh and Ross Fontenot, owner of Gentry. You can find out more about St. Hugh and Gentry by following the links on our websites krvs.org and itsacadiana.com. The producer of our show is Grant Morris. Our technical producer is Eric Morell. Our researchers are Anne Christian and Ali Coates. If you want to know what we all look like, you can find photos from this show on our, on our website, itsacadiana.com, and on our It's Acadiana Facebook page. These photos were taken by Gwen Oakwin. You can find out more about her on Facebook. You can get this show and past shows as a podcast wherever you get your podcasts, including Spotify. And you can find all of our podcasts on itsacadiana.com. You can also keep up with us on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. You'll find those links on our website, itsacadiana.com. Out to Lunch is a production of INO Broadcasting for itsacadiana.com and KRVS 88.7 FM. I'm Aileen Bennett. Thanks for joining me today. I look forward to meeting you again next week around the lunch table for more business Acadiana style on Out to Lunch. Out to Lunch Acadiana is recorded live over lunch at Cafe Vermilionville in Lafayette. Cafe Vermilionville is open Monday to Friday for lunch and six nights a week for dinner with a courtyard that sets the scene for fine Louisiana cuisine. The Out to Lunch Acadiana theme music, Encore Monsieur, Nice Guy, is written by Mitchell Foreman and performed by Mitchell Foreman and Andre Michaud. Out to Lunch Acadiana business consultants are Pete Prados from Innovate Acadiana and Dustin Ortego from The Opportunity Machine. Major support for Out to Lunch is provided by the law firm of Jones Walker, established in 1937 with over 375 attorneys in offices throughout the U.S., providing a comprehensive range of services to a local, national, and international client base, joneswalker.com. And by Shorten Associates, legal recruiters in Louisiana and Texas. Support for Out to Lunch Acadiana comes from the Wyndham Garden Lafayette, located off Pinhook near Cali Saloon. Wyndham Garden Lafayette is a pet and family-friendly hotel with reception space for large and intimate events, free parking, free Wi-Fi, and a free shuttle within three miles that includes the airport and downtown restaurants.